Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Peter says, In this, talking about our salvation, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being much more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. A man stood before a congregation who once was a pastor and declared to the people of God, I am not a Christian and I am proud of it. He said to his former church, I no longer believe in the Bible as the word of God. No longer do I believe that Jesus Christ is my savior. And no longer do I even believe there is a God. Once that man was asked why, he said, I don't believe anymore because ever since I've been a Christian, I've got nothing but trouble and heartache. I quit. One man said, I quit being a Christian many, many years ago because it didn't work for me. I tried it and it just didn't work, so I quit. So, what's the point? I mean, what's the point of being a Christian? Do we follow Jesus to get wealthy? Do we follow Jesus to get healthy? Do we think that by trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that somehow life is going to become a, a walk through the park, a tiptoe through the tulips, everything's going to come up roses, and life's going to be sweet from now on out? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, the question is, what do you expect to get out of it? Do you expect an easier life? Do you think things will get better because you're a follower of Christ? You see, I believe there's a lot of people who came to Jesus or tried Jesus or tried church or tried faith and somehow or another it didn't turn out like they thought it was going to, especially today when you turn on the TV and there are preachers saying, send me $10 and God will give you 100 and say a certain prayer or buy one of these rags from us and keep it in your pocket, get some of this special oil or whatever, and you try that and it doesn't work and all of a sudden now Christianity doesn't work, I'm disillusioned, I quit. And do you know that when we come to Christ, we will be severely tested in our faith. And God puts our faith to the test. And this morning I want to preach on the subject of the trials of our faith. And you need to remember who this is that's writing and who he's writing to. This is Simon Peter. And Peter was the guy who was so disillusioned when Jesus was crucified that he followed Jesus afar off, denied that he even knew who Jesus was. He was that guy who stood by the fire and cursed and swore and said, I don't know him. And Simon Peter now has turned full circle and now he's trying to encourage those people who may be almost as disillusioned as he was because he re refers to them in verse one as resident aliens scattered throughout Asia. These are people who are persecuted. They come to Jesus and as a result, many of them were excommunicated from their synagogue. Many of them lost their jobs and many of them were persecuted and were homeless and reduced to begging on the Roman streets. And I'm sure they're wondering 
Why in the world did I get myself into this Christianity thing? Ever since I said yes to Jesus, my life has gotten much more difficult. And so Peter writes his book to them because he wants to encourage them and their faith is in the fire, it's being tested and Peter says some things to them that I believe that may come in handy for us one day. And so let's look at what he says here when he says three things basically about our faith being tested. Number one, trials are certain to come in our Christian life. Trials are certain to come. Our faith will be tested. Now, Peter uses three things here to, to say about, and, and I'm gonna put them in reverse order, but they're all right there in verse six. The first thing I wanna point out is he calls them various trials. Various trials. Uh, various, the word various means manifold or diverse or multifaceted. The best word I know to describe various is if you hold up a diamond sometime and it's cut right and you turn it, sparkles will come out in multiple different places and their shades of cut, that's various. It's multitude, if you will, it's many. And we all know that trials come in our life in many shapes and many sizes. My uh, friend Ron Dunn used to say that that uh, good and bad travels on parallel tracks and they both usually arrive at the same time. Have you noticed this? Sometimes you get up in the morning, it's good, and before you go to bed at night, it's bad. I mean, you just never know what a day may hold. And we have a thing we say, when it rains, it pours. Sometimes you get a trial on top of a trial on top of a difficulty. And life is not always easy. The scripture certifies that all of God's children will encounter trials. We all go through these things. Job said, in Job 14 verse one, he said, man who is born of a woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Job wasn't having a good day when he said that. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter three and verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, he draw his sermon to a close and in the closing, he, Jesus said, there's two guys, both of them build a house. One of them's wise, the other's foolish. The foolish guy throws a house up just flat on the ground. He doesn't dig deep, he doesn't put a foundation. But the wise man digs down and builds on the foundation of the solid rock. And this is what Jesus said. Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now listen, and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall because it was built on a rock. Now Jesus didn't say if the storm comes or if the wind blows or if the waves slam, he said when it's gonna happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Storms of life come to both the wise and the foolish man. And the one who builds his house upon the things that Jesus said and does them is the wise man whose house stands firm. Peter reminds his readers again in chapter four of this epistle in verse 12. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter says it comes to everybody. It's gonna happen. Trials, trials. Sometimes I feel like them old boys on Hee Haw. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Y'all could, could sing that if you're old as I am. Uh, some of you kids don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But trials come from everywhere. Relationships. If you've ever been a friend to anybody, you've encountered a trial. Relationships, finances. People are having financial trouble all over the US. The economy's bad. Health issues. 
Why, I could probably go up and down these pews right here and hear more medical information than I even have a clue what you're talking about. I mean, you know when you're over 50 when you talk about your last doctor appointment to everybody you've seen. <laughs> Jobs, marriage, children, you name it. Trials come in all shapes and all sizes. That's why Peter calls them various. I remember when I was a child, just, just one episode in our life, my mother was taking my sister who had the chicken pox. They were just chicken pox on top of chicken pox. And she was taking my sister who had chicken pox along with my other sister who had rheumatic fever over to see my aunt because she needed to go see my daddy who was in the hospital. And on the way to see my aunt with her two, my two sick sisters, of course, she had me on top of that. And, 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 and mama pulled the, the car up on the train track and the car stopped and the train smashed the car. That was a bad day. <laughs> Various, all shapes and all sizes. And no one should think that simply because we're followers of Jesus, somehow or another we're gonna be exempted from all the trials of this life. The second thing Peter says is for a little while. For a little while. The question I had when I looked at that is how long is a little while? Because it's a relative term, isn't it? For example, if we're talking about the age of a fossil, a hundred years is a little while. <laughs> but on the other hand, if we're talking about a crying baby, 15 minutes is an eternity. So when Peter says for a little while, what does he mean? I mean, if you're undergoing a severe trial, sooner than later is better. Peter uses the term for a little while to put our trial in perspective. There are severe, painful, difficult things to deal with. However, they are not permanent. No matter how long they last, they are not permanent. I think that's what he means. There is a duration. All the difficulty that you're going through today has an expiration date. It will be eternal. It may help us to weigh these trials against what Peter said in verse four of chapter one. Listen to what he says. We have an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Weigh your trial for a little while against what you have in heaven. These various trials will fade away, but our inheritance is eternal in the heavens, reserved, kept waiting for us. Though in this world we are tried, tempted, and sorely tested, we know that we have a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Hallelujah. And the, other, the third thing Peter says is if need be. If need be. He says if need be for a little while you are tested by these various trials. If need be. That phrase indicates there is a meaning to these various trials. They are not for nothing. God has a reason for allowing the difficulties. And the problem is we don't always understand God's reasons. In the Old Testament book of Job, uh, if you read the book of Job, we are privileged to see behind the curtain, if you will. This whole drama is being played out in the life of Job. Uh, all of a sudden, fire falls from heaven. He suffers the loss of his family all in one fell swoop. His cattle are confiscated. His sheep are gone. His lambs are gone. And one thing after another. And what we see is that in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, behind the scenes, there is a great spiritual warfare going on. But Job has no idea what it is. All Job knows is, is things bad are happening to him and he just can't figure it out. His friends accuse him, his wife accuses him. And all Job can do is just hang on to his belief in God. And Job says in Job 13 verse 15, though he slay me, 
I will hope in him. Job says in Job 19 verse 25, for I know that my redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed, I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Job says you can do what you want, you can grind me to powder and I know my redeemer lives. And you see, I'm reading the book of Job I remember the first time I read the book of Job. I'm reading through the first 37, 38, 39 chapters. And all this, Job is declaring his innocence and he doesn't understand. And all Job's got three friends. Man, they're good friends. All through the book, they're just accusing him of secret sin. Job, you did this. You brought it on yourself. Something somewhere. You did it. You did it. You did it. And Job keeps saying, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Finally, Job says, I'd like to talk to God. Man, if I could just talk to God, I know if I could see him face to face and explain my circumstances to him, it would be different. And all of a sudden, at the end of the book, God shows up. And I'm reading along and I'm thinking, yeah, Job, yeah, tell him now, tell him now. And when God shows up, the only thing Job can say is, whoa, I repent in dust and ashes. For I've been talking about God and saying things I don't even know what I'm saying. And God never did explain it to Job. And I kind of felt cheated. Sometimes we think if I could just somehow or another understand a reason for this difficulty that I'm going through, if somehow in my mind I can think, if I can understand some deep spiritual reason why I have this trial, it would somehow make sense. The problem is sometimes in this life we don't get the answer. And that's hard. That's trying our faith. I remember Dr. Adrian Rogers said something one time that just really has stuck with me over the years. He had a son that died on Mother's Day. And Adrian said he struggled with that for many, many, many years. And he kept pleading with God, God, why did you let my boy die on Mother's Day? He's an infant child. Adrian said he finally came to the conclusion that when we don't have answers, we always have Jesus. And that, that, that may not be enough, but that's probably all we're going to get sometimes until we get to glory. And we can be certain that God does not allow these various trials for no reason at all. We may never know why, but we always have Jesus who said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so this morning you may be encountering various trials for a little while, if need be. And you may not have an answer this morning, and I don't have an answer, and nobody in this room has an answer, but we can have Jesus. And so he said, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So trials are certain to come. The second thing I want you to see in this text is trials confirm the genuineness of our faith. In verse seven, faith is compared to gold. Do you see that in verse seven? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. Faith and gold are both precious commodities. I mean... I don't know anybody in here that would turn down five bags of gold if I had them up here and were giving them away. You'd say, yeah, I'll take some. Uh, how precious is gold? I hear all these commercials on TV, you know, these apocalyptic sounding guys. Hi, I'm William Devane. And he's gonna sell you some gold, you know. He's telling you that, that the stock market's gonna crash and the world economy's gonna go bust. But if you buy piles of gold, you'll be safe when it happens. Well, that may or may not be true. I couldn't tell you. I'm not the one to give any financial advice. I don't even balance a checkbook. My wife does that. So uh, I don't know anything about money, but gold is precious in this world. People steal gold. People kill for gold. People risk their life and gamble everything they have for gold. I, I was reading about a, a, a gambling boat that, that, you know, one of them old river boats that sunk in the Mississippi. And when the Mississippi River got low, they, they were able to 
dive down in there and they got in the hull of that ship and down there where the gambling tables were, there were still men sitting around the gambling tables. They found skeletons at the bottom of the Mississippi River with gold belts around their waist. They had their gold. And while they were drowning, they didn't want to take their belt off and they drowned with it on. In August 1896, a fellow by the name of George Washington Carmack and his two native friends who were named Shukum Jim and Tangish Charlie <laughs> found gold in their pans in quantities never before seen in the Yukon and the rush was on. In just one year between 1897 and 1898, over 60,000 people made the trip up to the Klondike looking for gold. They stampeded and prospectors on the way in, encountered various perils they never knew to expect. Uh, multitudes were killed along the way. Some of the perils they encountered were avalanches, drowning, typhoid, scurvy, and spinal meningitis. There was no law enforcement in Skagway. Uh, thieves and con men were all along the route. In spite of it all, those people still risked their lives to get gold. A portion of a letter from a disheartened prospector survives today. He lived in a gold camp. Listen to what he wrote. He wrote back home and he says, Many, very many that come here meet a bad success and thousands will leave their bones here. Others will lose their health contract diseases and they will carry to contact diseases they will carry to their graves with them some will have to beg their way home and probably half that come here will never make enough to carry any back home but this does not alter the fact that there is gold here and plenty of it but it also shows that a poor frail man is liable to many disappointment diseases and death Gold is considered precious by the world's standards. But more precious is a person's faith. Peter compares faith to gold and he concludes that faith is more precious. Why? Because gold, Peter says, perishes, but faith endures forever. And faith gives you a much greater payoff than gold ever thought about. Now, have you ever stopped to think about this? You're not taking any gold to heaven. As a matter of fact, they've got so much of it up there, you've heard it before. They paved the streets with it, amen? So they don't need any of yours. Notice in the context of what Peter says in verse seven, he uses faith as a noun, not as a verb. Now, why does that matter? Because he calls it your faith. Your faith. By using the term your faith, what Peter is talking about is the sum total of what you believe because you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is saying that your faith is what you hang your salvation on. Your faith is founded on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your faith is what it is that gives you a living hope. And it is your faith that is precious because it is your faith that gets you to heaven. And so your faith is much more precious than gold. And faith and gold both are tested by fire. The ancient document that survived around the first century tells about the refining process of gold. He says you take the gold and you put it in the fire and you pile plenty of wood around it and you let it burn for day and night. In the morning you take it out uh, take the gold out and then you melt it again and hammer it and then you put it back in the furnace and for another day and night and you take it out and you mix a little red copper with it and you melt it as before and then you put it back in the furnace and when you have taken it out a third time wash it and carefully dry it weigh it when it's dried and see how much you've lost then fold it and keep it so in other words, they took that gold and they stuck it in the fire and they pulled it out and they stuck it back in and for three solid days they melted it and bubbled it and dipped the oil off and purified it. And that's the process of refining gold. But the purpose is to burn out the impurities and when the fire has finished its work, what you have is pure gold. 
Fire is to gold what trials are to faith. Trials serve as a purifying agent, burning the excess and impurities out of our life. Have you thought about how much energy we expend trying to avoid trials? I mean, if you knew your faith was going to be tried tomorrow and you could wiggle your way out of it, wouldn't you? Most of us do. We, we try to avoid it when really it's the thing that purifies us. Trials confirm our faith. Notice what he says, the proof of your faith. Have you noticed the number of people, listen, have you noticed the number of people who claim to be followers of Jesus these days? Many people these days make professions of faith, but when the heat is applied, sadly, they, they do not pass the test. I remember one of the first guys I ever witnessed to and shared my faith with, he was so eager to get saved, he said, man, I want to get saved. I want to, I, and he prayed and he came back and oh, he was just so happy. And they, three days later, uh, he didn't come to church and I, th three or four weeks went by, I asked him, I said, man, are you ever going to come to church? You need to get baptized. What's the deal? And he told me, he said, well, you know, after I got saved, I was so happy. But he said, my wife, when I told her, she laughed. And when she laughed, I decided I wasn't going to go to church. And I didn't want to do that. What happened? His faith got put in the fire and he failed the test. It is in the context of life's trials that our faith is proven. And you know what I think? I think that God's people, listen, I think that God's people need to get back to the statement, I can't do that because I am a Christian. What happened to that? What ever happened to God's people telling the world and all the things of this world, I don't do that, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. You say, what are you talking about? When's the last time you heard a believer say, I don't play ball on Sunday because Sunday's the Lord's day. Y'all take your team, you can go and play. I'm going to church. What a witness that would be. What a witness and the testimony that would be if you would take your young people and say, we don't do that on the Lord's day. It's God's day. You miss a great opportunity to witness. I don't drink beer because as a Christian, I have a conviction that it's wrong. Why don't God's people say those things anymore? I don't use foul language and I don't tell filthy jokes because it ruins my testimony. I don't go to those parties because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I read in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it talks about some people who have to take a mark on their forehead or on their wrist. It's called the mark of the beast. And if they don't take the mark of the beast, they can't buy and they can't sell and they can't do business. And I thought about that. And I thought about what would happen if all of a sudden the government came and said, look, you gotta come down to the courthouse. You gotta get your mark. You gotta get a chip. You gotta get something on your forehead. If you don't get it, you can't buy. You can't go to Giant. You can't buy any groceries. You can't get any gas for your car. You can't get a paycheck. You're, not gonna, you're just out of luck. You gotta take this mark. I'm thinking to myself, because in the book of Revelation, if you take the mark of the beast, you damn your soul to hell immediately. Oh, man, I thought about that, and I thought, people who can't choose faithfulness to the house of God in our easy, middle-class, suburban, Christian atmosphere are certain to sell their souls in the day of affliction. You see, God allows trials to come into our life to prove our faith. Trials not only prove our faith to ourselves, but it proves our faith to a watching world. When's the last time you saw real faith on display? You're not out to see genuine faith on display in the context of the office party. Gen genuine faith is more likely to be put on display 
in the cancer ward than in the church sanctuary. Genuine faith shines in the midst of loss and grief more than it does from the choir loft. Just this week, I sat at a table with Christian leaders, Christian leaders who were sharing burdens they had on their heart. One person shared that they have a close family member who's gravely ill with cancer and barring a miracle, that person won't live the rest of this year. Another person shared that someone very close to them was the victim of a rape. Another had a family member who died and her gay son uh, and his spouse were causing lots of problems in the family. And these are without question godly Christian leaders. And they are going through tremendous trials. And in this room this morning, if I could roll back the veil and the truth be revealed, there are tremendous heartaches, trials, and tribulations. And sometimes we wonder why God allows these trials and often there seems to be no good answer. But one of the outcomes of the trial is it serves to confirm the genuineness of our faith both in our own hearts and to the watching world. I was in seminary. Dr. Marvin Dale was sharing with his wife, about his wife who had epilepsy, and she died one night. She drowned in a bathtub. And Dr. Nell was out of class for about three weeks, and when he came back, we were kind of nervous about what he would say, and I'll never forget what he said. Brother Marvin stood before us, and he said, one thing I've learned through this whole experience he said, I believe all this stuff I've been preaching for the last 40 years. Trials are certain to come. Trials confirm our faith. And then finally, trials conclude. Trials conclude at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what Peter said in verse 7. He says that they may be found. That's the outcome. May be found the result our faith, the trials of our faith produce some things. And Peter lists three things that they produce. The first one is praise. They produce praise. Now this Greek word means commendation or worthy of noting. It is the same word that's used in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uses it this way. He says, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Listen to this. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Can you imagine what the Bible just said? The Bible says that God is going to praise some folks. Can you imagine that? The one who had nail holes in his hands and a crown of thorns mashed down on his brow. He will praise people who successfully encounter the trials of their faith and come out purified on the other end. Glory, praise, glory. This is almost a synonym for praise and it provides an emphasis to the fact that God will honor those people who endure the test. The last word is honor. The word honor is associated with money. We give people an honorarium. It is something to say thank you. It is a love gift, if you will, for doing a service for us. It is a price. One place it's translated precious. Honor, honor. My favorite Olympic story is about an old country boy named Rulon Gardner. Rulon Gardner took on that Russian wrestler in the 2000 Olympics. I never watched the Olympics, but for some reason I started watching it that year. And Rulon Gardner, he was this kind of heavy looking, kind of odd guy. And he took on this Russian guy who they call him, they call him the Russian bear. They said he had the most terrif one of the most terrifying sights in the Olympics was what they call the icy gulag stare of death. This old boy weighed 15 pounds when he was born. He, he, he practiced for the Olympics by running two hours in waist-deep snow. 
They said he put a refrigerator on his back and carried it 12 stories up the stairs. He ate a dozen eggs for breakfast every day. He had not been beat in 13 years. Not only had he not been beat, nobody had ever scored a point on him. Can you imagine that icy gulag death stare looking at you? I'm asking you, what in heaven's name would cause anybody to want to fight this character? Money? You couldn't pay me enough. Fame, fortune, he did it for one reason. He wanted to stand on that stage while they played the Star Spangled Banner and put a gold medal around his neck. It's all about glory. It's all about glory. That's what it's about. Listen, why in the world do God's people endure what we endure and not quit and not stop and not throw in the towel? Why am I not gonna quit? I'm not gonna quit because I ain't got glory yet. That's why. That's what keeps us in the game. Listen, the glory is gonna come. He says that it'll produce commendation, recognition, and valuation at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, for these momentary light afflictions are producing for us an eternal weight and glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, those are eternal. So what is the outcome of the trials in our faith? Authentic commendation when Jesus comes, we get to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it's for. So let's draw this to a conclusion. Peter's writing to resident aliens scattered throughout. It was not fun to be a follower of Jesus in the first century. It was no walk in the park. And today, Christianity done right will cause some difficulty. This world is not our home. John 15, 18, Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Following Jesus may get us left out of parties. Following Jesus may keep us out of the country club. Following Jesus may get us ridiculed, mocked, and despised. Following Jesus, listen, following Jesus may cause some of us our life. And this is why so many quit. They say, that's not what I signed up for. That's not what I'm in it for. Well, the only thing that's gonna sustain you is if you get in it for the glory of the well done when he comes. When Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, he was dead serious. You say, well, then why would anybody follow Jesus? Because when he comes, those whose faith has been tried in the fires of adversity receive praise and glory and honor. I'm gonna ask you a question. When Jesus comes again and you stand before him face to face, will that be joy? Will that be glory? Will that be honor? Is that gonna be well done, good and faithful servant? Or is that gonna be, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. You see, the Bible says there are two options there. For those who with, uh, with, with endurance and who hold fast and stay firm and love God to the end, there's reward, there's crowns, there's glory. But those who reject Christ, and those who, who, who deny that they know him, there'll be shame and punishment for eternity. Where do you stand this morning? Where do you stand? Nobody's joyous over persecution. I never knew anybody that sat around and said, oh, praise God, I get to hurt today. It's not the way it works. But the way it works is this. We know that after the trial, the glory comes. 
this morning, could you stand here this morning if Jesus came and say, I know I can go to heaven because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I trusted him as my Savior and Lord. I believe he died on the cross for me and, and, and I've, I've repented of my sins and I've trusted Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Can you say that this morning? Do you have the assurance that if you died today, you would go to heaven? You say, well, I don't have that assurance. Would you like it? Would you like to know that you know that you know that you're saved? You need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today. It can be your faith then. It'll be your faith that is precious. You need to do that today. I implore you today. And then let me ask you this. If Jesus, if you had to stand before him today at the judgment seat of Christ, would you say, I stood the test? I, 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 I stood firm. By God's grace, I stood firm. Or could you say, yeah, I was a Christian, but you know what? I compromised that whole thing. I just really kind of kind of didn't, didn't stand firm. I compromised my faith. How's that going to go? How's that going to go? Would you stand with me this morning, bow your head and close your eyes? Our instrumentalists are going to come this morning and I'd just like for you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and as they're coming this morning, I just want you to stop for a moment and think. This morning, there are those in this room who you're undergoing trials, trials that are inexplainable. And I don't have answers, but I have Jesus. And he's in your heart too, and you're a Christian, but you're struggling. Why don't you get a friend by the hand and pray together. Y'all lift each other up. Maybe this morning you need to come to Christ. We give an invitation. We ask if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You can do that during this time of our service. It's not to embarrass anybody. It's not to publicly ridicule anybody or to even make anybody nervous. We just know that if you make a public profession, you're more likely to stand by that decision. Maybe you want to join this church. God's laid it on your heart. This is the place he wants you to worship and serve. Whatever it is God would have you to do, would you do that today? I'm going to pray. And as soon as I get through praying, if God's laid a decision on your heart, would you come? Would you come this morning? As soon as I say amen. If you need to come, won't you come? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we are not happy about the trials, but because of your promises in the word. Lord, we know they are for the best. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for grace to endure, strength to pass the test, and Lord, that you would strengthen our hearts, our lives, that we may, on that day of judgment, receive glory and honor and praise. And then we'll give it all back to you Father, if there's those here today who need to make decisions, we pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen them and encourage them that they may come forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you need to come, won't you come while we sing?